Ah, okay. We are started. Okay, so um, Billy, again, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this is the second coffee chat. Um, and I ask you to help me with this because I, you are the court um, expert that I know, by the way. So thank you for agreeing to doing this. I'm looking forward to hearing from you about, because we got a lot to talk about, man. Yeah, it was it was a crazy term. Yeah, so about that, um, just a real quick reminder. Remind us about the term because the Supreme, we don't often think about the Supreme Court in terms of like when we think of terms, we think of two your terms for legislators. Um, you know, so explain that real, just real quickly. So, uh, term does not refer to the uh, tenure of the judge, uh, justices of the Supreme Court. In fact, all federal judges have lifetime appointments. Uh, they are Senate confirmed after being appointed by a president. Uh, so for the Supreme Court, when we say the word term, we're referring to the calendar year, uh, which is unique for the Supreme Court. It, it runs from October to September. Uh, and so uh, sort of in a technical way, we call it the October term of a given year. So October term 2022 ran from October of 2022 through September of this year. Okay, so that uh, makes 2023. sense. So that's the reason why when we go to look for these cases, we find it under the October 2022, even though these decisions were determined or released in 2023. Yeah, and that is often always the case. The vast majority of cases come out between January and June. Uh, and when I say the vast majority, I mean almost all of them. Uh, and that is really a function of the court's work. Um, they don't begin hearing cases until October. And on average, it takes about 60 to 90 days to get an opinion. So you wouldn't expect the first opinion before December anyway. Gotcha. So let's dive in, into some of these cases. Um, I have no particular order. So uh, I guess let's just talk about uh, Biden v. Nebraska. Oh, oh, we're, we're starting off with the big one or one of the big ones. Yeah, what? student loans. Yeah, so this was a 6-3 decision, right? Uh, it was, yeah. So, so the, I can't remember the, the, how the court is split uh, off the top of my head. We have, was, do we have six conservative judges? Yeah, we have six. Uh, well, okay. So the justices would take issue with us labeling them like this. So... <laughs> The justices do not feel that they are policymakers or political in any way. Um, yeah, political they deal scientists, with political issues. <laughs> yeah, political scientists would argue something very different. I definitely argue something very different in all of my papers, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but what what they would prefer to say is that six of them were appointed by Republican judges, or I'm sorry, by Republican presidents, and three of them were appointed by Democratic presidents. Okay, uh, so that that actually makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, so we have, so this was pretty much split right down then, partisan. It, it, it is an ideological decision. That's what what we would call it. Because, yeah, yeah, so all six Republican-appointed judges uh, mm -hmm. sided with. So, um, so obviously that impacts student loan borrowers, right? So Yes. The court said in short, what was it? Something to the effect of uh, the executive branch didn't have, it was overreaching? Uh, yeah. That it, in a nutshell, it said that that Biden could not do what he did. Right. Like Biden could not forgive the loans under the HEROES Act. So that which. Which did we then at all oh, this stuff, man? Um, Biden's going through a different way to trying to get this done, trying to get this piece of um, campaign. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, this is like one of his huge campaign promises. This is like a huge deal for Biden. And um, since the court 
said he couldn't do it through the HEROES Act. He is actually going to attempt to do it through the Higher Education Act, which honestly is, is probably a better home for this type of move anyway. Yeah. Um, this is actually so, a classic case for me about often when we hear about like a court decision, especially from the Supreme Court, given that they have a, a, a discretionary jurisdiction, Right when it when the court lays down a ruling, oh my gosh, that's it, my hands are tied, it's done. But what I appreciate about this particular issue, it demonstrates that no, no, yes, this this interpretation, this application, yes, it was struck down, but it does not mean that our hands are tied. That does not mean that any administration, regardless if we're talking about student loans or not, uh, that their hands are not tied. They can seek to get this done, whatever policy issue it is. Uh, just they have to go a different way. Yeah. So uh, generally, the when the court does this, what what they often say is that Congress probably needs to do something. Um, and they they do all of this talk about like the separation of powers and how important that is, and that uh, Congress should probably have a say. And they didn't explicitly say that in the law that he's citing to justify it, but. If I can, for a moment, just just sort of point out um, with any Supreme Court uh, decision, there's always the opportunity to sort of push back on that by the elected branches. They can always enact a new policy if they don't like what the Supreme Court has done. Sometimes that's a little bit harder. Uh, sometimes it it is a it is Mount Everest, really. But like, you know. You could hike Mount Everest, so you can you can do this, right? Like, but it's the idea that um, that you may have to do a constitutional amendment uh, in in some very extreme situations. Uh, so, good example of that would be like campaign finance. Uh, the Supreme Court generally strikes down a lot of stuff related to campaign finance, but we could pass a constitutional amendment. That says, you know, corporations cannot give money to campaigns, that there are personal limits uh, set by the Constitution for campaign donations. And there's but no it would recourse. Require, pardon? There's no recourse on the court side to strike down the constitutional no, amendment. No, if it's if it is a constitutional amendment and it is properly adopted under constitutional procedures, then it binds the court. Okay. Alternatively, alternatively. There is sort of like a, we used to call it a nuclear option, but now the Senate has something that it calls a nuclear option. So it gets a little, little dangerous in wording here, but sort of like blowing it all up, as it were, one option Congress has is they actually can remove jurisdiction from the Supreme Court. So if Congress wanted, it could pass a law that said, well, the Supreme Court cannot take cases related to student loans. Um, and at that point, then it's really a matter of the executive and the legislator fighting it out. None of that is ever going to happen. Like, I need to super stress that. Like, this is this is literally like a, a like a, a literal nuclear bomb in in the constitutional setting. If if they were to do that on these high profile issues, it would it would just not not sit well what what's interesting for me though is th again this is a really strong reminder that how much power congress has given the supreme court and it, this, this is what i mean by that um well not power that's not what congress has the ability to regulate the court because they get to determine right the court size they get to determine um jurisdiction uh, so, so that's interesting to highlight. What's another thing interesting for me, and I don't know if this is a legal argument for or against, I don't know, but the idea that it, specifically within the context of student loans, that Congress didn't have a say in this. Well, Congress, my understanding of how Congress works, right? Uh, they pass legislation, the executive can either veto it or sign it into law, right? Uh, if the executive wants to do why, Congress could enact, pass a law, 
to forbid the executive from doing X, Y, Z, to do Y, whatever Y is. Uh, the executive can then veto. Okay, fine, but they can override the veto with two-thirds majority vote, so the veto doesn't really matter, so it gets set into law. It binds the hands of the, of the executive. So if the, if the if Congress really wanted to say no to student loan forgiveness, they could have done something. So this idea that they didn't have a say seems a little... So there, there are a couple of complicated things here related <laughs> to that. Um, the first is that back in, I'm going to get the year wrong, a few years ago, uh, Donald Trump proposed actually doing something very similar to this. And Nancy Pelosi, who was then Speaker of the House, held a press conference where she said he cannot legally do this. Um, that Congress should have a say in it. Uh, as politics goes, we had an election. Uh, Biden became president. Nancy Pelosi has changed her mind about whether or not the president can unilaterally forgive loan money. Um, but the House of Representatives now has a Republican majority. And the House of Representatives indeed passed a resolution, not really a law, but a resolution for what yeah. that's worth, saying that the president could not do this. And let's be clear what a resolution is. A resolution is a basically the opinion of Congress, right? Yeah. It's, it's basically yeah. just a, a formal statement by Congress agreeing that, hey, this whatever this is that we're, we're saying this resolution to, um, this is our opinion about it. Yeah. Uh, now, the Senate did not take up this resolution, so it was not a concurrent resolution. Um, but uh, if the Senate had taken it up and also voted for it, that doesn't necessarily bind the president. But it's a strong but, indicator. But it's a strong indicator that it binds the president. And so... Um, Biden would then have been faced with the reality that he he wouldn't have gotten away with, you know, forgiving loans or whatever. Like Congress would have like, if the Senate agreed and the House agreed and he did it, uh, there would almost certainly be impeachment proceedings as as a result of that. Um, but I to get back to the ruling, I I I know that we talked about this case uh coming up today I, and i debate on how much to say about it because there's actually very technical stuff um in this case so the first thing is there were actually two cases about student loans one was the administration being sued by a set of states and one was the administration being sued by a set of borrowers. And the borrowers were complaining that they weren't going to get enough forgiven under this. And therefore, the whole thing was unconstitutional. And the court basically sent them packing. Like, all nine justices agreed that is not how the law works. Um <laughs> It's so and weird so, to see, by the way, the Supreme Court unanimously agreeing on one thing right now. Actually, actually, that's not true. Um, this year, the court has been largely what we call relatively unanimous. So there's either been nine, zero, eight, one, or seven, two opinions in almost every case. It is only these big hot button cases where we really kind of got the these divisions. Um, so this term is actually very amicable and also very surprising. We often ended up with unexpected groupings out of the mm. court this year. But um, so I didn't mean so to do that. which is to say that that not all of them were the Republicans together and and the Democrats together. Like like people were crossing over sort of in very unexpected ways this term. Um which lends, you know, some dis, you know, some credit to the people who say, well, they don't 
do policy they just talk about the law um does that 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 is one sort of if you will tick in in support of that argument but okay so there were these two cases to get back to my point here the two cases the borrowers and the states and the supreme court said no to the borrowers when it came to the states the the case is formerly called biden v nebraska because nebraska was the first one to file the suit and so their number came up first but in the ruling the supreme court said only missouri could actually sue that the other states on the the lawsuit could not so it's only missouri that could sue because they have this like technical thing with a loan borrower and i'll i'll spare the details there but like they are in some way tied into student loans <laughs> and um so that allowed them to sue and then the supreme court said and the biden administration is forgiving so much money that's outlandish so congress should have a say and this is something called the major questions doctrine which is not a constitutional concept it is not a statutory concept it is something the court has created and basically, when somebody does something and the number is really big, they say Congress should have done it because the number is really big. Like that is the major question doctrine that like this impacts so many people, Congress should have done it. It, it isn't a legal theory like like it is a legal theory because the court said it is it, it wasn't something that existed until a couple of years ago oh wow i did not know that yeah it, it is often what the court uses to strike down like epa regulations they go back to this idea of the major questions doctrine and um part of that is the argument that congress has given up too much power that it's handed over too much to the executive and this is one way for the court to pull Congress back in and say, you need to step in on this. Its use, one could argue, has been very selective, but uh, it's been used so little at this point, we don't have enough data to say for sure. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, when I think about Congress and relationship it has with courts uh, and well, with the union branches, um, it's hard, right, to get a group of people to agree on one thing, yet alone political issues. Uh, so again, 400, what, 535 people uh, together, you know, 435 in Congress and House, 100 in, in Senate. Uh, it's, it, would be, it would be hard to get them to agree on anything, get, especially given this partisan climate that we're in now. Um, yeah. Congress. Yeah needs to get involved though more often seems seems like what the court is saying and and the court says that quite a bit now quite a bit the court says congress should do something about this not the president not the courts so well, I mean, and it makes sense right I mean, and i say it makes sense it makes sense for congress is up for election right the house side they're up for election every two years so they are held accountable to the we the people more frequently uh than any other um branch so I, in a way i can i can actually buy into that, to that rhetoric buy into that argument um uh, but it's so difficult right now for congress to do anything that it almost seems like um just throwing it back to congress is basically saying we're done with this issue it, it, it's more saying we want to be done with this issue <laughs> than it is saying that we are done with this issue. It, it, it's mainly because, as Biden showed, there are multiple avenues. And so even though they said, oh, this is too much money to forgive under the HEROES Act, they didn't say this is just too much money to forgive, period. Period. And so... Um, now he's doing it through the Higher Education Act, which is much more about executive power and authority um, because it sets up the higher education process. So um, it 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 seems 
from like a political standpoint on Biden's side, the Higher Education Act is probably a safer one to use, but I don't foresee the court liking it, period. Yeah. Well, I guess we can move on then and talk about formative action. Because that impacts colleges too, sticking with this thing, yeah. higher ed. So, what's up? What, what happened? What's going on? I know it was a. Uh, I know that we it struck down formative action, and this was what a. Um, I can't remember. Was it another six three decision? Yes, this was very much a six three decision. Yes. So what happened? So, uh, students for fair admissions. Uh, which is a um, sort of a, a student activist group, uh, sued Harvard and the University of North Carolina. Um, the University of North Carolina is a state college or state university. Harvard is a private university. Uh, they sued both entities saying that they use race in their admissions processes and that that is unconstitutional because it resulted in um, it resulted in people being admitted solely for the purpose of their race. Uh, that was the claim. Right. Uh, now, was that happening? That depends on how one views the admissions process. And that got kind of murky in a couple of points during the oral argument it's been very murky in the news like it's very clear that 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 news pundits don't know the admissions process to universities at all um and so like there there's been a lot of like there's been a lot of accepting facts that may not actually be facts about the admissions process but the court accepted those facts and said that these universities were violating the 14th Amendment and that they were admitting students based on race and that that was unconstitutional and that no one can admit students based on race except military colleges. There is an exception built in for military colleges. The justification for that was that the leaders of the military should look like the rank and file of the military uh, because that lends authority and it lends trust to those officers. And uh, this is a point that that has kind of come up a little bit here and there uh, on that, but it what is important to say, you know, earlier I was talking about how the justices would would push back on us saying that they do policy. Mm -hmm. This is a very good example of the court just doing policy. It's there's no constitutional carve out for university or for military universities. There's no statutory carve out for military universities in this. They said it's unconstitutional except for military universities. And there's no constitutional provision that would support that. Like no constitutional provision was provided to support that. So All of the briefs that argued that this separate, like this military exemption was needed, argued it was needed for social reasons, not legal reasons. It sounds like then we have two separate standards. Uh, we do have a separate standard now for military colleges. college admissions. And, and to be clear, like this is a very limited set of college admissions, right? We're talking about the people who get admitted to like West Point. Right. And the Citadel, okay. right? Like we're not talking about, we're not, we're not talking about like veterans who are applying to schools or something like that. We're, we're talking about, sp you are in the military you are applying to be an officer and go through the university process for that. Um, that what, is the carve out. What doesn't make what doesn't make sense to me, and you know, is is the idea that 
it, they, the court said it's unconstitutional, yet we'll allow it in this one specific case. Yeah, which, which is why I say that this is an example of the court actually making a policy, um, because that's what it's done. It said it's completely unconstitutional, except in this one instance. And the court alone is speaking on that. Like no one else passed a law or enacted something where only military universities could could do that, right? Like this was a practice at many universities and the court said no to everyone but the military. So a recourse then, Going kind of going back to that to, to a point that you made earlier, a recourse then would be if we made a constitutional amendment. Yeah, so this is an instance where a constitutional amendment would be required. Oh, wow. Or later on, the court would have to change its mind. And th th I guess as a point, I I probably we might I this is on me. I should have mentioned this earlier, but the, the court has made profound decisions throughout U.S. history, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some were good. Some were horrible. Um, oh, yeah. And, and the court has reversed those decisions years later, but they did undo them, right? Uh, yeah. Famous cases. Brown v. Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but Brown v. Yeah. Board of Education overturned um, Plessy v. Ferguson. Um, I'm still waiting uh, I don't know if this. I don't know if the court will ever hear another case on this, but I'm still waiting for the court to overturn Buck v. Bell. I don't. I don't think the court's going to take another case to do that. No, I, I don't think so either. But it would be nice because that, to me, is a that is uh, that is definitely a stain. And yeah, yeah, okay. and and for people who don't know, that is a a eugenics decision. Where basically the the Supreme Court endorsed eugenics. Uh, anyone who's take who's taken my federal government class, we go over that one pretty significantly. That's yeah. Anyway, so oh. so yeah. Um, and okay, so I one one quick note though on overturning cases because we often talk about overturning cases, and then we talk about how like you know uh, the conservative court overturned Roe v. Wade and right. a liberal court overturned Plessy v. Ferguson, and and we we kind of make it out that like um, conservative courts only ever overturn liberal decisions and liberal courts only ever overturn these like you know racist or sexist or you know conservative sometimes not lumping all that's not all lumped together those are three separate categories of cases to be clear uh that that liberal courts overturn but one case that was an absolute horror in american history was the korematsu case which allowed the roosevelt administration to contain japanese citizens in uh what were effectively concentration camps they didn't call them that, but that's what they were. Uh, and that was actually overturned by a conservative court when they ruled on Trump v. Hawaii. So a conservative court handling a conservative uh, immigration issue overturned the stain in American history. So we shouldn't always assume that we know based on the court's composition, 100% of how they will do things. No, just with certain hot topics, maybe. <laughs> uh, hot topics are a little bit easier um, just because presidents make campaign promises. So even though like at every confirmation hearing, a judge will say, oh, I've not promised anything for this seat. Like, I don't, I don't think anyone is surprised that Roe v. Wade got overturned, for example. I don't think anyone's actually surprised at the affirmative action outcomes um, because this has been on sort of the, you know, agenda of conservative presidents and conservative groups for quite some time. Uh, and, and now they have six justices appointed by Republican presidents who they expect will rule in these higher profile cases in those ways and 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 so far that has largely played out there have been a couple of exceptions but it's largely played out 
And another interesting note, um, and this is something I touch on in my classes when we talk about um, the Supreme Court and a little bit about the executive, the idea that we feel the effects of previous administrations well after oh, yeah. they, they, um, they're out of office. For example, uh, through the Supreme Court, if any president gets, asked, gets to actually appoint anyone to the Supreme Court, we feel the effects of that administration for decades. Decades. Well, yeah, they, they have... They have life tenure, so we we would fill it for decades. Unless they retire or they get impeached. Or they pass away. Or they pass away. Uh, yeah. So we yeah. and we've never impeached. Well, we've impeached two Supreme Court justices in American history, but we've never done it in modern times. It's it's deemed a, a too too political an act to now do. It's well, I mean it's the nuclear option. Uh, for the one of many we have many nuclear bombs yeah. when it comes to the supreme court yeah <laughs> constitutional yeah. amendment uh statute uh impeachment um is there, is there another one i'm forgetting maybe possibly <laughs> there are now questions about like who should control the ethics of the court things like that so so yeah there, there's a lot going on there but to to go back to the affirmative action cases, um, uh, so one uh, there are a couple of interesting things about the case aside from the military exemption. So the first is one thing that you're going to hear a lot is that um, there's going to be groups saying affirmative action has been overturned, and there's going to be groups saying, well, they didn't technically throw out affirmative action. They just threw it out in a very specific way. And that second group is responding to how exactly admissions work. So when you apply to a four-year school like the University of North Carolina or Harvard, as part of the application package, you have to fill out uh, some sort of essay. And historically, there has been a big push by, by universities to encourage people to put things into that essay that are very personal. So to tell universities about struggles that you have overcome, to tell universities about something in your life that was difficult, that shows that you're resilient and strong and determined, all of these things that we look for in students in the classroom, right? And the in, in the past, that hasn't necessarily required you to state a race as part of that mm. discussion. This Supreme Court opinion is going to change the nature of those essays because those essays are now going to become about like overcoming racial division, overcoming strife, mm. stuff like that. Because when an admissions counselor gets the packet to make a decision, first of all, it's not a physical packet. It's on a computer. Okay. Uh, and if you do send in a paper application, which you can still do, uh, there is someone who enters all that information into the computer. So when the admissions counselor gets it, they don't see your race. They don't see your gender. That's not information they have access to. They've, they've not had access to that for years. I worked in uh, enrollment services back in 2013, and they didn't have access to it 10 years ago. So I know they don't have access to it today. Um, and so it is not that the admissions counselors were making any sort of affirmative action decision. What would happen? And, and the other thing too is often the thought is they get these applications, they sort of stack them in groups and mm -hmm. categories. And then they say, okay, we're going to accept so many from this stack, so many from this stack, and so many from this stack. Like that's the idea people have about how affirmative action worked. What actually happened is that the admissions counselors go through and they make all the decisions. And then 
someone well above that pay grade decides the size of the class and you know after a certain and and it's entirely about when you've submitted it when you when they clicked whether you were admitted or not etc um you know a wait list will start at a certain point and when it comes to admitting people off that wait list sometimes what those basically deans of admissions would do is they would get together with a committee and they would say, okay, this is the makeup of the class. It's, you know, 86% white, it's 3% African-American and whatever, right? And then they would say, based on this, based on previous cohorts, based on the population of the school, we need to bring up certain populations in this class so that they match, if not exceed the school. So these are people who were admitted to the program. Mm -hmm. And they were admitted based on their merit. But schools argued that they had a vested interest in us being exposed to diverse populations. And that express interest is what was guiding those final decisions. So that's how affirmative action actually worked. The court said none of the stuff before the dean said, okay, so we want this population to be better represented. And so there was this fundamental misunderstanding of how affirmative action was actually implemented. Not necessarily by the executive branch, but by how people actually executed it within colleges. Within colleges, yeah. Like, this is entirely a college-based process. Like, very few groups or people outside the university had control over this process. And so what you get is you get this decision from the court that's like, this is based on race, therefore it's unconstitutional. And then you get these dissents where the justices pretty much go into the historical record and they say, this is the reason affirmative action begins in the first place. This is the legacy of affirmative action. And these are the legal arguments that support allowing that to stand. So that's what's happening in that case. Like the court strikes it down, except for military schools, says you can still put it into your statement. And the liberal justices say, we shouldn't have struck this down. This was correcting a historical wrong. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, was it working in the first place is a different question because many public universities are still over 85% white when the population is only a little over 50% white. So, so like the, there, there was a question of whether that access was working in the first place. None of that was addressed by the court. The court said simply we're throwing this out on constitutional grounds. So it's going to make the admissions process harder for people. Because they're going to have to, not harder in the sense of you've got to like physically do more work, but I wouldn't be surprised if schools now offered you an opportunity to write a diversity statement, or they offered you an opportunity to write a second essay or something. And, and while that, that doesn't sound like it's a huge deal, I mean, you, you take someone who's you know, like, like take, for instance, anyone in this class, right? Like they've got other classes they've got to do. They've got other papers they've got to write. And now when they're applying to transfer to a four-year school, they also have to write no, an extra that's... essay on top of that. And, and uh, I'm having worked in enrollment services, I will tell you essays can make or break your admissions to schools. And and so, like, now we have this additional barrier for everyone. Because now, like, 
Whoop. people like like you you take for example uh you know a a a white male in a rural area he's he's going to feel like he has to write the second essay or he's going to look lazy mm -hmm. so it's a barrier for him as well so I, one thing that's going through my head right is colleges can still choose to practice affirmative action practices right i mean just because it's a deemed unconstitutional by the court with the exception of military colleges um those practices and those um procedures that those the colleges have adopted with affirmative action in mind can still be practiced right i mean I mean, technic okay, that 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 gets into some dicey grounds about like can the court be ignored and <laughs> and what have you. I, technically, yes, they could still do it. Is it wise for them to do it? No. Especially Are they going funding. to do it? No. Um, they're going to lose federal funding. They're going to be sued left and right. It's it's just not worth it for them gotcha. to do it. Well, yeah. Well, Billy, so, uh, oh, go ahead. No. Oh, no. What were you going to say? I was going to say that I know time is running out. Um, I know we want to talk a little bit more about the other cases, but uh, yeah. I think we might I, want. I, oh, go ahead. Oh, no. I, I was going to say, I, I, looking at the list of cases, I think we can run through most of them pretty quickly. All right. Let's, with do, what's this. Left. let's do this. Let's do this. The two we just talked about are kind of like the big wins for college college so uh, so we have the united states v texas uh, which was an immigration case um surprising to me what well, this was an eight one decision that was not surprising to me to me it was uh again uh so uh so what's what happened what's going on so uh in in that particular case the state of texas um does what it loves to do, which is to sue the federal government. Um, Texas, this is this is a unique situation in Texas. They just love to sue um, the federal government. It's deep within our roots. Um, we <laughs> oh, it 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 for sure is. Um, but in this particular case, they were suing the Biden administration, saying that they were not enforcing immigration laws properly. That the Biden administration wasn't doing this and biden uh, the administration it's not just biden but any president's over ice right yeah mm -hmm. okay yeah well the executive branch is over exactly. ice the president right. is not who the director of ice directly answers to no but but, but the bug yeah. stops here with the president because ice is part of the executive branch and but yes yeah. yes you're, you're yeah absolutely yeah right. so so they sued the united states um saying that you know biden is not 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 doing this properly the executive branch isn't doing this properly and the supreme court said uh that may be true but you can't sue the president for this and kick them out a Repub sorry six appointed republican judges have a control basically of the court and said, five of five of them joined with the three liberals to say you can't sue the president because he's not enforcing laws the way you want him to. I know. OK, so why is this surprising to me and why is this not surprising to you? It's not surprising to me because we have never allowed states to do that. Like. Like, this is not a new question for the Supreme Court. I And I, the Supreme Court said, we've never allowed this. We're not going to allow this now. Okay. Yeah, yes, but bear with me real quick, right? Uh, Roe v. Wade was the, uh, was the law of the land for me. Um, and, you know, that decision was made well before I was born. And yet it was overturned, what, last year? Um, mm -hmm. This court has proven to, you know, stare decisis, maybe not a high priority. Um, so, so uh, I'm surprised. A, a lot of people were surprised by this outcome. 
um, because the thought was there are six Republican appointees and three Democratic appointees. This is a Democratic president. This is immigration, which is a very Republican heavy topic. The argument then, you know, seems to suggest that Texas is going to win this one. Um, and the Supreme Court basically said, look, you can't prove that him, that Biden or the executive enforcing the law the way it does has in some way massively uh, and negatively impacted you. And because you cannot prove that, you cannot sue them. So get out. So get out. And again, that's pretty... Consistent. Pretty standard. The, the the other reason this doesn't surprise me and something that doesn't get talked about a lot by the punditry uh, of cable news is that one thing about the Supreme Court is that whole idea, we call it standing. That's the legal legal phrasing for it, that you have to have an, that you have to be injured in some way, be that financial or physically. And that injury has to basically have happened or be super imminent. And what they were saying is that the state of Texas has not proven that with the way they brought this case. Mm. Like states have sued the federal government before and, and won, but like they they've been able to prove these like clear violations. And this was like, well, we expect that there's going to be this flood of fentanyl into Texas, right? Like that was part of the argument. And the court was like, wait, so is there or is there not? And so like there, there were a series of things. Now, whether or not the president is enforcing immigration laws the way he should be, that's a question the people are going to have to decide in 2024. But the court was saying, you know what, we're we're not wading into this. Too so, political. Um, no, this particular court is not afraid of the politics, despite what they say. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I think that they they just sort of stuck to their rules on this one. Um, and so it wasn't a surprise to me, and it wasn't a surprise to me listening to the oral argument, like. The chief justice was incredibly skeptical of Texas's argument. Um, and and that really was just sort of a death knell for the case. Speaking of states, um, Moore v. Harper. Ah. This one's interesting to me, uh, being a former elections worker, uh, I, it's interesting uh, to me being a native of North Carolina. So, uh, so yes, in, in, anytime we see the Supreme Court handling, uh, giving, uh, giving rulings on elections, um, it, it can shake the tectonic plates. This one didn't. Uh, I am happy to applaud that. So, late. late I disagree. On us, I'm. I'm going to say this did shake the tectonic plates. I, I'm going to say that it did. Um, so to quickly just cover the facts of the case, in the state of North Carolina, they created a, a congressional map um, that was heavily gerrymandered. The North Carolina Supreme Court at the time struck it down and said that political gerrymanders violated the state constitution. Uh, and the Speaker of the House of Representatives for the state of North Carolina sued saying that um sort of adopting not sort of but completely adopting this very novel fringe theory that because the constitution says that the states will set the laws for elections that means that only state legislators can do that and state supreme courts can have no say in election law whatsoever uh, because the Constitution says that the state legislators will set the rules. Um, 
like I said, this is a very fringe, uh, fringe argument. But the reason I think this actually sort of shocks the tectonic plates is because this argument that state legislators can do this without state courts intervening was an argument very central to efforts to overturn certain election results in 2020. So this was an argument that was made in relation to Arizona. It was made in relation to uh, Pennsylvania. And now the Supreme Court has come up and said, that is not at all. That is not at all what is happening here. That is not what that means. And the root of this, so to, to put this bluntly, they said that this argument that state legislators don't have to answer to state courts is wrong. Is that that's a clear violation of separation of uh, checks and balances, separation of powers, like everything. Yeah, like all that, that's constitutional... literally that's literally what the court said. They they said we have never held that the Constitution prevents state legislators from being subjected to state judicial review. Um, and that's pretty much what the argument was on the other side. That like, it says states can set the laws, but the laws of the states are bound by the constitutions of the states. Was this, uh, what was the decision on this one? Was it? Um, an, it was another... a 6-3 decision, but, um, but what was interesting about it is, all right, so you've got the three Democratic appointees, the Chief Justice, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Barrett are in the majority. And the Chief Justice wrote the opinion. Um, in dissent, you have Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, and Justice Gorsuch. Oh, wow. But what's interesting about the dissent is that Justice Alito only dissents on this idea that the court shouldn't have heard this case. Um, and that is because in North Carolina, the Supreme Court flipped while this case was being heard by the Supreme Court. And it basically retracted its opinion about political gerrymandering. So Alito's argument is none of this matters because now the state of North Carolina, these Republican legislators are allowed to do what they want, according to the state Supreme Court. So we don't have to talk about this at all. And the argument of the Chief Justice was, well, this did happen. There is a slim majority on that court, so it could happen again. We might as well just make this decision. Yeah. And and that's what they did. Is this is this another indication then uh, that Chief Justice Roberts is a institutionalist? Uh, he is largely an institutionalist. There are areas where he is very strategic and very proactive. Race is the big one. Um, he pretty much authors any opinion that's striking down race as a thing. Um, but beyond that, he he tends to be a pretty heavy institutionalist. And if because if the state legislatures got the way, right? What this would basically say is, hey, courts, you don't matter to us. Yeah, it, it would basically say that legislators could make whatever laws they want to make about federal elections and state courts can't do anything about it. So if they decide that, you know, you know, if Texas was to decide, you know, you get to vote and then afterwards, you know, we're going to divide those votes by the number of people in your county and and do, you know, some sort of math to come up with something that's always going to be the way we want it to be then the Texas Supreme Court couldn't come back and say, that makes absolutely no sense and that's dumb. 
So it's um, at, so okay. So this can put the death nail then in, at least for now. Uh, for it, this it, 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 it puts a death nail in a lot of arguments. So and so I, I use sort of an extreme, sort of ridiculous example there. But to bring it back to something that's very likely to happen, like uh in Wisconsin, for example, we're seeing this be a really big deal already because the Wisconsin legislature is very heavily gerrymandered to be Republican, and its Supreme Court just got a Democratic majority. And so that legislature is probably going to get overturned a lot in things that they try to do. So because typically state Supreme Courts that are that have more Democrats on them have a tendency to say things like, well, limiting the number of ballot drop boxes is an undue burden on voters, right? Like there was this whole thing about like all of Harris County possibly having one place to drop off a ballot. And, you know, it could take you two hours to drive one direction across Harris County, right? Especially depending on traffic. Oh, yeah. And so, and so like, we would say that's an unnecessary burden on voters. Um, and so, because there are also a lot of laws, right? Like, I can't just take your ballot and drop it off. That's illegal. It's illegal to do that, right? So, so I mean, we're talking about, you know, uh, elderly people who had a drop box at the end of their street now have to have someone drive them three hours across the county to drop it off. You know, if a you know it if that's what the legislature decided and they answered to no one on that, then there would be no state court to intervene on that that case. After hearing you talk about this, I can understand now why you say this does shift the tectonic plates. But I think the reason for me, um the reason why I don't see it that way. Again, checks and balances. This is this sounds common sense that uh, the states, the state legislatures, should be subject to court ruling. Uh, I don't see this as a tectonic shift because that's what it should be because our constitutions are set up state and federal is set up in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I. I, I think another way to put this is that, like, theoretically, the plates are not shifted. In practical terms, the plates have been shifted. <laughs> so it's um, nuanced. This is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a nice way to say it. Yeah. It's <laughs> All right. Uh, so, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to ask if you wanted to. To hit the next case. Uh, yes, our last one. Uh, what is it? 303 uh, Creative LLC Creative. versus Analyst? And, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Alanis or, or, or something. Thank you. Like that, yeah. My students know how bad I am with names, so it's, it's okay. It, it's, it's quite all right. Um, uh, so th this case is about whether or not a website whether or not an individual could be required to make a website for a gay couple when they were getting married. The Supreme Court said, no, you can't force the website designer to do that. They said that's a violation of free speech because the website designer does not want to say that they are endorsing gay marriage, but by creating the website, they are thereby endorsing the gay marriage. Um, so in the oral argument for this case, there, so there are sort of two points I want to make about this case. And, and you know, we, we can talk sort of about both of them. The first is about what the court says and how the oral argument went. And the other is about the actual facts of this case, because we have come to find out they are not at all what we thought they were. <laughs> um, so the court said that 
you know, forcing a website designer to do this is forcing them to create art. And if you're forcing them to create art, you're forcing them to express. And if you're forcing them to express, that is speech. And you cannot, under the Constitution, be compelled by the government to speak. Okay. Um, so this was a 6-3 a decision. Again, the three Democratic appointees and the six Republican appointees. Um, and it was written by Justice Gorsuch. And, and so uh, Justice Gorsuch and Justice Alito are like the two big free speech, free freedom of religion justices on the court. They tend to write those cases. And so um, Justice Gorsuch basically wrote this violates uh, the the lady's name is Lori Smith. That's easier to say than three or three creatives. So that's what I go with. Um, said that Smith's uh, rights were violated because Colorado has this law. So those are the facts that like that's the ruling. We came to find out literally like a day before the ruling came out. We found out that Lori Smith does not make websites. We found out that Lori Smith was never asked to create a website. And we found out that the person who she signed an affidavit saying asked her for a website for his gay marriage is a straight man who has been married for multiple years. And says he never asked for a website. Before we get so, into so so basically the entire case was made up. <laughs> the entire well, case was just made up. It's not be, before we dive yeah, into so, the case. So th this gets real technical, but there is a legal sort of do-over, if you will, for this. Uh, the state of Colorado can file a motion with the Supreme Court saying that the facts of the case were not the facts of the case and therefore the ruling was erroneous. Um, that may well happen, but it's really a waste of time on everyone's part. Because even, even if that happens, then they're going to find they being, you know, the court is going to find a case where a um, website designer was indeed asked to do this. They're just going to take that case and we're just going to get the same opinion. Right. But, but, uh, it, but there is something to be noted that the entire case was, was pretty much made up. And that, for, so I have a couple of questions, right? The first question I have is, is there any legal consequences for basically making up this case? I am not a lawyer, so Same. I do not know. Uh, but my inkling is that since Lori Smith signed an affidavit, which is like giving testimony to the court, that there, if someone wanted to push perjury, I don't think that that would be a surprise that it happens. Okay. Uh, so that's the first thing that came, comes to my mind. The other thing is, I, I hear you. If, the, if another similar case were to come up before the court as the court stands right now, yes, uh, we will see the same outcome. But until that time happens, this decision stands on on faulty, false, falsehoods. It doesn't make sense to keep it standing. It, it doesn't make sense for the, the ruling to stand to to uh, stick. Well. I don't want to throw gums into the gear of that, but I'm going to, or gum, not gums. <laughs> Sorry. Um, not, not to throw gum into the gears of that, but I'm going to. This is not the first time in American history this has happened, and it won't be the last. So to give you a couple of examples of the past, um, uh, let's start with a big case, Marbury versus Madison, right? Marbury versus Madison wasn't a made-up case. Like, that was a legitimate action that was 
a legitimate right. claim, which is that uh, Marbury was being denied his judgeship. Um, but the Supreme Court said that the Secretary of State is not an officer of the government. So, like, that that is factually incorrect, <laughs> right? Like, that is false. But that was Madison's argument. I am not an officer of the government. And the Supreme Court accepted it. It's completely factually incorrect, but they accepted it. Something much more similar to this situation actually is a case about the Southern Railroad uh, and deals with the 14th Amendment. So, you know, we talk a lot about whether or not businesses are people under the Constitution. The, the case that said that they are people is this case about the Southern Railroad. I believe it was the Southern Railroad, some railroad company. Um, and the lawyer for the railroad company was a former congressman who was part of the drafters of the 14th Amendment. And he goes before the Supreme Court and he says, when we drafted the 14th Amendment, we most certainly felt that corporations were people. We most certainly were thinking about that when we drafted the 14th Amendment. And it was just a lie. He lied to the court to win a case. And now corporations are people. Like, but despite that fact, despite that that is a well-known fact, <laughs> the Supreme Court still treats this decision like it's 100% normal. So it isn't unusual for, for there to be like questionable information given to the court or questionable arguments made. It's just this was a really flagrant example. For me, cases like this, uh, cases that deal with civil rights and civil liberties, uh, there's no win. There's no winner. Um, let's hypothetically say that that uh, the facts of the case are real. To force someone to make a website that potentially implies endorsement is, I can see that not only as a violation of, you know, free speech, but potentially even a religious argument can be made. Yet at the same time, uh, by denying services to anyone, uh, you're denying civil liberties, um, civil rights to a, to a group of people. There is no, to me, there's never a winner. Uh, everyone's a loser in this case. Um, yeah. But so, get, the, but given that these facts are not real, I, this yeah, this it, drives me nuts. Might yeah, yeah. It's 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 quite the case. That's for sure. And it's going to show up in a lot of papers as being like this weird moment in the history of the court. But but something to something to also consider is that we're talking about creating a website, which is very different from, say, running a hotel. And the, the whole argument centered around whether or not the public website or whether or not this website was a public good. So, or a public service. So like a hotel room should be open to everyone in the public who can pay for that right. hotel room. Right. So there is a Supreme Court case that says, well, you can't deny someone's ability to move into or to rent a hotel room based off the color of their skin or, and, and that's been expanded to, you know, logically expanded, not the court hasn't ruled on this, but logically it expands that you also can't deny them based on their religion or because they're gay or whatever, because that's a public good. A hotel is a public good. A website is seen as a little bit different because it isn't created for the public's good. It's created for private individuals. To it's appeal to the public. Well, yes, but one thing to think about with a website is you can create websites and you may need a code to get into the website. True. Okay. 
yeah. or um you know uh you know with a wedding cake like that wedding cake is very specific to that couple if they have asked for a specific wedding cake and specific wedding cake design so this goes back to the baker case which is the root of this case right like which so that so uh basically that is the argument at play whether or not these things are truly public goods yes sir. now the next case we're going to get like I, I don't know what the next case in like the gay rights area is going to be i know the next case about something like this is not going to be a pretty situation it's going to be a situation where an atheist has denied a Christian couple something because of their religion and doesn't want to be seen as having to quote unquote speak what that couple wants them to say. This, this hypothetical is goes right in hand with if with the philosophy that I, I often think about when we talk about politics. What can be done to one group can be done to another yeah so th this sure. i this idea that oh what's a violation of my uh free speech what's a violation of my uh of my religion to do this okay but if we rule in that way then do not don't be surprised right don't be surprised when when an atheist goes i'm not making you a cake for religious purposes or you know you know lack of religion whatever the case may be um don't be don't, don't so don't get angry <laughs> yeah because like this does this does go further right like so right now the argument uh of Lori smith was you know i i don't believe in in gay marriage and so by making me make this website you're asking me to to yeah. endorse that but like you know it I, one would would think that she also disagrees with the teachings of islam so like uh you know if uh, if a muslim couple were to come to her and say we want this very specific you know islamic teaching to be on our website for our marriage you know is she allowed to turn them down because she disagrees with whatever that teaching may be and and then we we even get division like you are talking about this this type like the way okay two things here one i'm going to give an example and then two i'm going to explain why this is not the hyperbolic conversation that some people think it is because okay. some people really think that we're blowing this all out of proportion okay but but um the the other example I want to give is like even within Christianity, which is a lot of what these cases center around, is that you have Christians who don't want to be forced to speak uh, in support of gay marriage. But like within Christianity, you have groups that believe that the woman should always submit to the husband. Mm -hmm. And you have groups who don't necessarily adopt that teaching. If a group that does hold that teaching asks a website designer who does not hold that teaching to make them a website, but they want that teaching as part of their website. Can the other Christian deny them? And the answer under this ruling is yes, they can. The thing about this ruling is that the court. So, okay, back when we had the Baker case, mm -hmm. Baker as in a Baker, not as in someone with the last name Baker, but back when we, we had the wedding cake case, one of the concerns in the oral argument that was brought up by Justice Kagan was how many professions are we going to have to go through with this? And she was like, she literally asked, what about a website? She asked, what about your hairdresser? What about the person who does the makeup? What about the person who designs the dress? Like, at what point do we stop this? And basically, 
the court shrugged at it and was like, well, we'll take it as it comes. And this time they tried to do this wholesale thing where they were like, okay, Justice Kagan was right. And we're not going to take this as it comes. That's a lot. So basically, if you create art, you can't be forced to say something. Okay, but what is the art? <laughs> right. Right. And so they 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 give us this like very broad ruling that you know people cannot be forced to say something they disagree with. And it's because they did that broad ruling, you know, attempting to head off the hairstylist and the makeup artist and all of that, that we end up with this vague legal language that now has to be sorted out. And all of those hypotheticals I just went through are entirely logical under that language. This this gets complicated very quickly. It does, yeah. Cases of uh, that that baker case, uh, the wedding cake case. Um, yeah, that that's again. I don't see any winner here. There's only losers because uh, if you deny service based on you know. Uh, a principle that you have, then you're denying, uh, if you force that individual to make them that cake, you're violating their beliefs. But if you favor, if you rule in favor of the baker and say, no, they can they can reject it, they don't have to do it, you don't have to force them, then you're, uh, you're literally discriminating against a group of people. So the, for me, there is no winners in this case, like whatsoever. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it it does get kind of crazy too. And we've actually already seen it get kind of crazy. Um, so uh in like a really out there sort of reaction to this, uh, well, it's not entirely out there, but like very hyperbolic reaction to this. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the actors who is known for his work in the Sopranos put out a statement that said he doesn't want anyone who disagrees with gay marriage watching his art. And he cited this case. Oh, wow. Yeah. He was like, I don't want them watching it. They can't watch it. And he cited this case. I mean, that's, you know, we can argue that the facts are very different there, but like, same, I mean, same that, principle. That's that's what we're walking into. If 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 we were to wrap this up, but um, I think it's it's clear, clear as day, that the Supreme Court absolutely has an impact on our daily lives. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Uh, if if there's any doubt that what the court does in you know they're not elected they're not subject to the elections process uh they often we don't even view them as political because they aren't subjected to to the elections um let let the, let this be the, the foundation here of they impact us on a daily basis um yeah there are so many things to say about the Supreme Court. Any, any, because I know we're running out of time. Any last final thoughts you had though uh, about this, about the session, about these specific of these cases, or about any particular case that you that you paid attention to? Um, so there, there will be two things I say to to kind of wrap up. The the first is about a case. So, um, there was a case that the Supreme Court decided this term called Brockin v. Holland. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a major case in the Indian Child Welfare Act, uh, which is a very technical act. But what it comes down to is that um, in the 1950s, the federal government was just kidnapping Native children off of reservations and was saying they were living in poverty and were therefore being um, basically being abused. So they equated poverty with abuse, but only for Native children. Uh, and then they rehomed those children with white couples. Uh, and the uh, Native American tribes went to Congress and lobbied uh, 
to enact a law that said uh, if a native child is in the welfare system or uh, in in the child welfare system, that uh, native populations were given a preference uh, for that child to live with them because the idea of kidnapping the children, because I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's literally what was happening. Right. Um, that's what government documents show was happening. Uh, and that was happening because there was a concerted effort by the federal government to basically deculture the indigenous tribes in the United States. And one of the ways they were doing this was by taking their children and, for the lack of a better phrase, making them white. And so we have what, what, yeah, so now we have um, what is some somewhat referred to as sort of like a lost generation where there's like a whole group of a whole generation of natives uh, and indigenous peoples who are just finding out they're indigenous peoples um, because they were taken and, and placed with white families. And so a couple out of Texas sued, the Brockings sued, saying that uh, this law was race-based because it gave a preference to Native Americans. And that preference was based on race. Uh, the Supreme Court did not buy that argument. They said that's that's not true. It's not what's happening here. Um, and the justification for that was that Native American tribes are sovereign under the U.S. Constitution. If they are formally recognized by Congress, they are sovereign entities. And this law was not about race. It was about sovereignty. Mm. And so basically, this would be like taking a Canadian child and placing them with the family in Texas. Yeah. You know, it, it did. It's the same equivalence in the, in the view of the law. Uh, when and so, um, so yeah, there, there's that. Uh, the second thing I want to point out is, um, so just hold on, if you don't mind, just to be clear, then the court struck down the argument that it was not race based. Um, that, that, that this, I think they ultimately skirt that exact language. Um, what they said was that Congress definitely had the right to pass this law. Okay. And that they passed it under this view of sovereignty. Um, but Justice Barrett, uh, Justice Barrett wrote the opinion. And she basically skirts this idea of race. Like she tries to like answer the question without answering it. So I imagine there will be another case because someone's going to ask that very specific question mm. to get a very specific answer. Um, but it doesn't bode well if they take that back to the court. Like the court had pretty, pretty strongly endorsed the Indian Child Welfare Act with this ruling. Yeah, well, I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, 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 you're good. Uh, the second thing I, will, I I wanted to say was just sort of an interesting view of the court. This term was uh, Justice Jackson. Um, she's the newest justice on the court. Uh, she's an African-American lady. Uh, she was appointed by President Biden. Um, and usually someone's first term on the court's pretty quiet. They They don't do a lot of like big decisions. They don't they're not very active in oral argument. They they're adjusting to the job, and so they're trying to like not really put themselves out there, kind of thing. Justice Jackson just like hit the ground running. Apparently, um, she was very involved all term, um, very involved in questioning. She was very involved in opinion writing. Um, she was sort of jumping all over the place and who she was siding with. Um, so I think she'll be interesting to watch as as her tenure goes on. Um, 
but the other thing about her is that she what, what's interesting about her is that she really takes the opinions of her colleagues seriously so like justice thomas whom she vehemently disagrees with and you can see that in the writings particularly in the affirmative action cases um justice thomas who she vehemently disagrees with is very big on history and so in oral arguments justice jackson will show up with this like cvs length receipt of history that she then takes the court through as part of the oral argument like and she basically is like look if we're going to take history seriously let's talk about all these different historical points and how that's playing into this uh she says okay if we're going to take these legal requirements very seriously let's talk about that oh we're going to do statutory interpretation well let's talk about the exact words of the statute like she's very on her game and very much able to speak with different parts of the court um and that that sets her up to be a very influential justice so she'll be one to watch whether you agree with her or not you know to each their own opinion um but you know from from an academic standpoint she's going to be important i think uh you know for me just some some final thoughts as we uh as we wrap this up i think for me this uh, we've demonstrated you know how many times now with these cases that this court impacts us on a daily basis uh, Congress does have some power over the court if it so chooses to use it. Everything from, uh, you know, how many justices actually serve on the court, the sort of size of the court, the jurisdiction of the court, um, and, and you know, so Congress could Congress plays a role into this whole entire process with the court, uh, so they could get more involved if so if they so chose to. Um, what's interesting for me is just note the dynamics of the relationship between the three branches of government, and we can see how they interact with one another, specifically with uh, student loans. In this particular uh, case, at least, with uh, Biden v. Nebraska, we see how Congress is basically saying, ah, we don't really want to be a part of this, <laughs> but we're not going to do anything about this yet. The uh, executive wants to, uh, the Supreme Court saying, eh, let's have all three at the table. Let's have everyone at the table. I think that, you know, so it's just interesting to know uh, when we when we talk about these cases, we can see how these years, they work together. And that's what's really fascinating to me. Um, we often view these decisions, I think, maybe as, as this kind of like a vacuum situation. Uh, but no, like the, these we, we see this interaction of the branches together, uh, sometimes in concert, sometimes in uh, dissonance, but we, we see that. So Billy, I just want to say, man, thank you. It's been fun. Absolutely. And, and uh, we'll see you sometime coming up soon. Yeah. All right, man. You have a good one. You too. Bye.